Well, good morning, everyone. You know, the influence of the large ridge that's been planted in the center part of the United States is quite evident just looking at the last 24 hours of total precipitation. Of course, your eyes probably attracted down here to where Harold went. So this is the heavy rainfall that's moved across parts of southern Texas, some places picking up four to five inches of rain, a couple of locales picking up even more than that. And this is some of the first rainfall that has hit southern Texas in months. Uh, in fact, you can trace a couple of these areas back over 60 days since the last time they've measured any sort of precipitation. A lot of isolated, scattered storm events that happened throughout the Intermountain West. A lot of this is remnant from, uh, from uh, Hillary. And then we did watch isolated storms kind of roll through this part of the Great Lakes. And we're going to continue to keep our eye here as well as we go forward. We can note that there is a few storms that did pop up just on the periphery of this larger ridge that's sitting in the United States. So as we've been talking about now for several days, we need to know where that ridge is going to be going forward, how long its presence is going to be exerted on the heat that's in the midsection of the country, and what its transition might do to the overall pattern as we switch out of the month of August and head toward, um, head toward the month of September. Now, I'm going to link this in the um, below in the notes because this is one of my, I think, my new favorite website for uh, kind of summarizing the tropical activity. It comes from a guy named Tomer. Uh, he is out of Oklahoma University. Just beautiful graphics here showing us the activity. So we can see there's Harold. We're watching another tropical system possibly develop here uh, just off of the coast of Mexico. Franklin is interesting. We're going to talk about Franklin more in a few moments, and we're still watching a bit more tropical activity here. Now, overall in the tropics, even though we're approaching the, the peak of the season here over the next, uh, what, three weeks, we are seeing a bit of a just a quick slowdown in the activity. We had a lot of air that was rising over the last uh, several days, and so we're going to see that uh, kind of the rebound of that over the following several days. And also the MJO, which was in a near perfect position to kind of take the cap off of this, is starting to move back into null space. So there's a couple things going on here. But go to his website and check it out. I'll make sure and link it for you because you can end up looking at individual storms and kind of seeing the forecast of those storms. We're looking here at uh, Franklin, so just having a good look at it. But you can even click on these and start to get even better simulations, and I love this. So what we're going to do is we're going to blend together the European model, the GFS, the UK Med, and the CMC, and play all of these together to look at the eventual path of Franklin. So Franklin is going to spend today going over the island of Española. It's then going to make this hard turn back to the east before getting caught back up in the prevailing wind direction, which is going to pull it back a bit toward the US and then make this turn kind of paralleling uh, the US coastline. But what's nice about this is you can see each of the models, you can see the, the color coding telling you uh, which model it's coming from. And he's even put this kind of what he calls an ensemble ellipse to kind of give us the best idea where this is going to go. Now, this is going to be a very, very useful tool uh, just for visualization once we get farther into the hurricane season and we have a, a tropical system, another one that's going to threaten the United States. Okay. Okay, so let's put some perspective on some of this recent rainfall. I want to pull up a map that uh, shows you the last 30 days in terms of percent of normal rainfall. And this goes back, uh, this uh, data is valid through yesterday. So that's why you don't see the rainfall in Texas. So it's just to make a point here that everywhere that you see zero, all right, there were some places down here that had not measured uh, not only in 30 days, but beyond that. The extent of the drought that is in Texas, in Louisiana, and Mississippi, um, I finally got to kind of see firsthand yesterday. Um, I was at an event and uh, flew into, uh, um, I was from Des Moines, flew into Dallas, and I, I just couldn't believe how uh, brown things were from, from the sky. And I was also just trying to explain to some friends back home in Illinois, I said, you know, the heat wave that we're currently experiencing Parts of Texas has been enduring now for, for over 40 days. And so it just kind of put in perspective what some people across the country are experiencing versus others. So this is going to continue to be uh, an issue. Now, remember, when I make these maps, I, sh I should work on this this winter to improve this because I stop my color bar at 300% of normal. So that'd be three times normal rainfall inside of a 30-day wind field, uh, excuse me, 30-day window. And we, of course, know that there were places in through here throughout Texas that have received, or excuse me, California, uh, up into parts of the Intermountain West and then curling around here uh, that have received far more than this. And the, the map doesn't quite capture that. But it is a good map just to step back and look at the areas that have um, kind of seen the larger disparities in total rainfall. So I'm thinking a bit over the last 30 days about large sections of Iowa, pockets of Kansas. Of course, we talked about the South. But you can also see in the Mid-Atlantic and the Carolinas, several places here that have missed out. 
And that's not to ignore what's going on in the Red River Valley of the north and in the Canadian Prairie, which lately has seen better precipitation, but has been quite dry throughout most of this summer. They're trying to harvest right now uh, across much of the Canadian Prairie. We then have, keep discussing this kind of corner uh, of, of uh, Oregon and Washington as just showing up with exceptional drought in places. But with all the heavy rainfall that came through California, I did want to go and look yesterday as the sky started to clear off just to see what I could see from some of our high resolution satellites. So one of my favorite sites, worldview.earthdata.nasa.gov, it stitches together several of our polar orbiting high resolution satellites so we can have a better view here of what's going on. And it was what I was really looking for in California was to see if I could see any sort of significant discoloration in the high resolution uh, satellite data to indicate massive flooding. And it's just not high enough resolution to see that, unfortunately. But what I was able to see, and it's kind of zoomed in here, you can tell the difference between where there's still snow in the Sierra Nevada mountains and where there is cloud cover, all right? And so even with all that moisture that came over, we still can see some of the snowpack here in the Sierra Nevada. Just incredible to see that. Since we're talking about the West, I do want to bring up the latest data from California's reservoirs. Now, this is going to continue to change once a lot of this water drains into these reservoirs, but I can only find one reservoir that is not above its historical average, and that's down here, the Casitas uh, um, Reservoir. Every other one is above its uh, historical average at this particular point, and therefore we are going to finish a water year in October without the exhaustion of all the water in these reservoirs. So this is going to be critical for the upcoming year. Plus, with the developing El Nino, we continue to talk about this will uh, be a major, um, you know, resource for California going through this winter into next year. So we've got more water than I originally anticipated. I thought back in spring, after we watched all these reservoirs fill up, that they would be, um, you know, back below historical averages already. But that was not the case this year. So they've maintained their water. This is excellent, in my opinion, management of this uh, resource. So let me take you to some set, uh, radar data, excuse me. This is just over the last about 12 hours or so. So we can see the isolated storm events that have been throughout the West. We watch, watch this as it resets. There's Harold uh, delivering extremely heavy rainfall in Southern Texas and over parts of the Rio Grande River. Uh, and then you come up here into the central United States and you see a lot of very interesting behavior with the radar. A lot of um, contamination with interesting uh, kind of spikes on the radar beams. But the dotting in the background, all of this, this is actually where we have some radar beam ducting going on. So that's where the radar beam, as it tries to propagate out and up, uh, ends up hitting a very strong temperature inversion. And that temperature inversion changes the index of refraction so great that it actually produces what appears to be, a. it really just bends the beam, but it looks like it's bouncing off of the inversion. And it can get stuck and therefore stays very close to the ground. And as the inversion sets up like it does overnight, we're actually getting these echoes. The blotchiness here is echoes off of wind turbines. So I'm going to show you something neat about this. This is how strong the temperature inversion was um, was forecast to be this morning. So it cooled off to 77, but the temperatures just a, you know, a, a few hundred meters above the surface are still extremely hot. You know, well over, um, you know, in, in the upper 80s. And so the temperatures later today will warm up, but that's the inversion which we're talking about. The other side of this are the complex of storms that are rolling over the periphery of the ridge here into the Great Lakes. And we're going to continue to watch that region later today. The Storm Prediction Center did make some modifications on this, which I thought made a lot of sense given the forecast data that came out. They're going to shift the risk of some stronger storms east. You know, yesterday they had them back in Illinois and Indiana but they're starting to pull that bit farther to the east due to the strength of the cap on top of this, uh, the, the potential for convection in this area. So this is today, getting into tomorrow. So notice that's moved a bit farther to the east. And our high resolution rapid refresh model, I think was the best initialized. The NAM was not initialized very well this morning. So as we play this forward throughout the morning hours into midday today, there's the remnants of Harold, some isolated storms in Florida complexes of storms moving through parts of Ontario. And we're gonna watch late this afternoon and this evening for some of these storms to possibly be severe, all right? Now, as this plays forward through the overnight hours on Wednesday into Thursday morning, these models continue to want to line out these storms. Can you kind of see that behavior in Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia? And I, I just don't, while I see it in the models, I don't think that this is gonna be a time where the models will accurately be able to predict what these storms are gonna do. Um, 
you know, more than probably 24 hours in advance. We do note that the moisture from Harold, if you were watching over here, did move through New Mexico, Arizona, is now into Utah. And this is going to be important for the moisture later on this week, coming out into parts of Colorado, Nebraska, and Kansas. So to go have a look at that, this is the latest seven-day forecast from the WPC. And you can see where the moisture from Harold is expected to move through the four corner states and deliver potentially heavy rainfall in parts of Wyoming and Colorado and then move out into parts right here, almost mostly focused on the border between uh, Nebraska and Kansas, right in through this area. Outside of that, there's the storm events we've been discussing here. Better chances for rain in the Carolinas out of this pattern. And we need to take a look at when that's coming in in just a few moments. Um, but I want to put some perspective on this rain coming into Colorado. So I pulled up a map that shows you from January 1st all the way until yesterday, precipitation ranks by climate district. So we're doing this to kind of identify this climate reporting district there. Currently, right now, this one in Colorado uh, is having its wettest year on record. And if you look west, we had the incredibly wet weather in January, then again in March, and now we've had the moisture from Hillary come through. So, so much of California, Nevada, and then pulling farther north has been exceptionally wet as well. This is the Midwest drought, which was largely dominated uh, by the pattern in May and June, but we've had a few pockets hang on much longer than that. And I know you're looking at Texas going, wait a minute, I've seen how dry it's been. Well, remember back earlier in spring, there were parts of the Panhandle of Texas that picked up in some places over 20 inches of rainfall. So that's why they sit near average for the year because of how wet it was early. You can also see the drought that's hit part of the Mid-Atlantic, but in the New England area, remember all the flooding we saw here earlier in the year, many of these climate reporting districts still showing up as the wettest uh, on record. Okay, I wanna give you next the latest update from the European model. And this is just gonna be total accumulated precipitation. So we're playing this through Friday, getting into Saturday. So I'm trying to identify when the next rounds of the heavier rain are expected to come through. So I'm seeing a lot of this showing up because we've already talked about this, okay? I'm seeing a lot of it showing up on Friday, getting into Saturday here and here. Storms also spread in New England at that time. Now, could we get some isolated storms that get into the Corn Belt here? It is possible, but the models are gonna bounce around a lot with that projection going forward. So this is going out there to next Tuesday and to Wednesday. And I just wanted to see getting out that far, how much moisture made it into the Pacific Northwest. Remember how dry we are right here. And if we're gonna to continue to see any sort of tropical development coming off of kind of the, the Yucatan after going over parts of Central America. But outside of that, you play out the next 10 days and then compare it to average, this is what we get. These are precipitation anomalies over the next 10 days from this morning's European model run. So what I do see is there's a, there's a lot of places in through here that are gonna be exceptionally dry as we finish off this month of August. And many of those places were very, very wet at the beginning of August. I'm thinking a lot about parts of the Midwest and Mid-South in particular. All right, let's now go and look again at the risk of some tropical development. We're gonna keep an eye right here on some convection that could cross Central America and then eventually make its way up into parts of the Gulf of Mexico. There is still you know, better than a 30% chance, according to the European Ensemble, that something could form. It's not in the next five to seven days, it's beyond that, but it's just something I wanna watch carefully. This is Harold, okay? This is that um, center down here that has a 70% chance, according to the National Hurricane Center of Developing. We'll keep an eye on that. And this was Franklin, which we talked about at the beginning. So we're just keeping an eye on the different areas of tropical activity. Next, let's go have a look at what the upper level pattern is going to do. So here's our ridge we've been discussing. The pattern is very much set up with this ridge staying in place. We have deeper troughs anchoring both sides. So it's going to stick around for a couple of more days. There's not much to move this in the near term. But as I play and you watch where this goes, you'll notice that by the time we get into Friday and Saturday, let's pause it right there. Friday into Saturday, this trough begins to develop, which means cooler air is going to be coming into this area while the ridge retrogrades. Models are still picking up on that high over low pattern just along the west coast here of North America, which is what's helping to pull this ridge back to the west. But as we saw in the model runs earlier, the cooler weather that's coming in uh, will start to warm up considerably again. So by the end of the month, playing early into September, we see broader, higher than normal heights indicating above average temperatures going into the beginning of September towards Labor Day. So I'm, I'm expecting a cool down here, 
I'm expecting heat to stay south and move back into the west temporarily. And then this is going to fill back in with some warmer conditions as we try to finish this month. So let's go ahead and have a look at uh, precipitation, then we'll talk through these temperatures. With that pattern, there's not a whole lot to move a lot of moisture back into the Midwest. So that's why we see in, in all three models kind of some drier conditions. In fact, let's just take you know, a look mostly here at what we've got from the CP, or, yeah, CPC, keeping this area drier while we're wetter southeast and we're wetter in the west. So that is, uh, I think, a pretty good forecast overall given the pattern I just showed you. But right now we're having a lot of discussion about the heat that's in the middle part of the country. And so we see these expansive um, you know, heat warnings that stretch all the way, I mean, almost the whole of the Mississippi Valley here. But it was interesting yesterday, if you were to go from southern Minnesota to northern Minnesota, there was over a 30 degree swing in temperature. Think, same thing for Wisconsin. And we see that today, we're gonna have a similar setup. Oops. Notice that right along the border here, we could have temperatures over 100 degrees, but in northern Minnesota in the 70s. So what this is indicating is as we go from Wednesday into Thursday, look at the cooler weather beginning to show up here. So the heat is still very much on throughout the Corn Belt all the way to the south. And this is how things look by Friday. And getting into Saturday, that's a big blast of some cooler air that's expected to come in there. We play forward into Sunday, it remains, but we know that the temperature is going to rebound in the central part of the United States starting next week. So maybe by Tuesday and Wednesday, we're seeing that rebound happen. The South does not get a break in this really at all. And even into next week, when we'd say this is our coolest day next Tuesday, we're still deep into the 90s throughout much of Texas. Okay, how about a five day sliding window look at these temperatures? Here's your next five days. There's the cooler weather coming in. That's day five through 10. But watch the rebound happen day 10 through 15. So this is really the first week of September here. So that's what we see in terms of the temperature pattern going out that far. Okay, just a quick broader discussion. We are still expecting above average rainfall coming into South America, Brazil's main growing area. It's still about um, you know two and a half weeks before, maybe three weeks before they're going to start planting, but it is moisture that's going to help recover some of the um, you know the moisture loss from their dry season. Uh, we also just want to tell you that El Nino continues to show uh, better and better signs of developing, and one of the things I'm going to be paying close attention to over the next several weeks is this. Now we talked about this earlier in the year, but when we have strong El Ninos, the subtropical jet tends to get going. And that's why even though September could start off warm and dry in this area, we need to be on the lookout for what we could see for heavier rainfall in this area going forward with the invigoration of the subtropical jet later in September. That's important for the Mississippi River Basin, which of course we know have to, we have to watch carefully for drought conditions. That's gonna be very important for the recovery of moisture across parts of the South and the prevention of another deep fall drought like we saw a year ago. So we continue to see better jet stream level wind flow getting out into the month of September, which means it could start off one way, but then transition wetter as we go forward. Plus we always have the wild card of the tropics, which reaches its peak. Uh, on about September 10th through the 15th. So I'll leave you there. I look forward to talking to you again very soon uh, when I get uh, home tomorrow morning. And until then, have a good one. Thanks.